All right, now we are moving on to segment two. We're going to talk about the challenges and solutions. We are going to start with Malachi on this one. So Malachi, what are some of the main challenges you face when running a Griffs game, and how do you overcome them? Well, I think one of my major things is your generic MOOC NPCs. They're, when you sit down and you look at the rule, the books and everything, it seems kind of daunting you just want to make just some random nobody coalition soldier. Now, back in, in the uh, older, the original main book, you could actually get some really simple, easy to make NPCs in the back, which they, sadly they took out of the Ultimate Edition. Um, you know, if you get, you know, you pick up the PDF or pick up the anniversary one, you can use those to kind of. Hold on a second. Sorry. <laughs> is it crashing going no. on? It's got an earthquake. <laughs> no, not an earthquake. Fighting cats. Oh, okay. <laughs> Fair enough. But um, you can use those as an idea on how to set up if you want to use something else to make a simple NPC. Or even go back, watch the old Codex Albana games on how Bear did his NPCs. I think he did very did a really good job of the mooks and stuff that you fight you know i think he's like one or two hits depending on your damage you can take out a mook i think that was a really great way to do it you know malachi it's funny you say that and i shouldn't chime in now but i'm going to but i think what the what you just said is true for almost any game and i think a lot of times game masters i don't say forget that but they they just don't think about that myself included sometimes where you not everybody has to be a fleshed out character sheet mm -hmm. sometimes they can just be a couple of numbers yeah you know what one one outstanding thing that this character is known for maybe a name and how many hit points it has if even that or just one hit it dies you know and yeah. and move on because you know in some sense Oh, I'm going to get a lot of flack for this, but in some sense, you're the hero of the story, right? Where it's like, yeah. you know, where you can move on. They're still challenging. They can still hurt you. They can still slow you down. But ultimately, if you're going to go toe to toe, you're kind, you're kind of the guy going in, you know, knocking those, as you call mooks around. And I, and I love that. I think if there's one thing that D&D 4th Edition did amazingly well that I wish other people in D&D would have picked up upon was the mook system. Yeah. So, um, yeah. so, go ahead. Oh, no, I was just going to say, you know, what you were saying... Oh, you're going to get in trouble for saying you're here of the story. But in its essence, Palladium has always been a very cinematic system yes. where you want to do that kind of stuff. So you shouldn't be getting in trouble for that. So, so I, I was going to skip you in the follow-up, but I'm going to ask you this follow-up now. Okay. Uh, so what are your strategies or what strategies do you use to balance the power level of characters with diverse abilities and equipment? I think it best is to – I always use a Glitter Boy as an example. You got GMs, get the glitter boy out of his armor once in a while. A lot of your bigger, beefier characters, you just have to get them in those situations where they don't. Like the glitter boy doesn't have access to his armor. Maybe like the juicer doesn't have access to his weapons or something. You know, it's more the situation and putting the characters out of their elements. Mm hmm. Okay. Excellent. Let's uh, move up to Frank. What are some of the main challenges you face when running a Rifts games, and how do you overcome them? You're muted, sir. So of course, uh, <laughs> I'm mute. Technology. Um, a lot of it has to do with how how far and wide you want to uh, scale your adventure. Um, I did a post on adventure design that talks about this, uh, starting small and building up from there. Uh, you've got a goose egg and you're going to start from there and you got a number of goose eggs off to the side or you progressing through the various paths and each goose egg uh, is either a, a combat element or a social element or uh, NPC interaction or just an event that happens that the player characters have to deal with. Um, I prefer low fantasy settings in terms of I don't enjoy playing or game mastering a session where we are um, uh, in effect fighting the gods and or defeating the major muscle movements uh, within the plot line for Rifts uh, writ large. So I, I am not happy. I will do it if the player group wants to do it. We can go about and try and figure out how to assassinate Emperor Prosec 
and change the coalition states for the better, or to go in and influence the way the coalition wars with Tolkien happened. Okay, I much prefer scaling the adventures down to what discrete element, what adventure elements I can take my players through and what specific objectives they can achieve within the global context of a much grander strategic plot line. Um, so in North America, you've got the Tolkien Wars, you've got the Minion Wars, the Juicer Uprisings, you had the Mechanoids, what else? You got the Vampire Kingdoms, you got Atlantis that's on the coast, the Pecos Empire, New West, everyone's favorite. Uh, um, <laughs> The, the New West is a very misunderstood uh, book in terms of you and uh, Heathen Dog. Um, <laughs> but then you go to Europe and you've got England, which uh, is is uh, dealing with uh, Arthurian legends come back to life, but not necessarily. The New German Republic is deal dealing with Africa, Russia, all of these things. I mean, when you look at them all in the context of what's on the map as a whole, yeah, it is easy to feel overwhelmed. That's when I would tell a new GM, and uh, you know, and I'm going to start offering this uh, in in the future, having chats with new GMs and say, okay, what is it you want to achieve, and what are the limitations that you can apply to your adventure design to keep things from getting too overwhelming, because you don't need to be the general in charge of the entire army that's invading the Tolkien War. You can just be the scout crew. Or the siege, uh, the the search and destroy team that is out to look for a very specific element that is going to have strategic implications. That is a very discrete, small level uh, adventure that then has more global consequences. Um, so that that's one of the things that I would do. You're not gonna you're not gonna play a god. You're not gonna be able to teleport into Shy Town and nuke the emperor. Um, but you can certainly get into the burbs and start causing problems for the coalition states. Or you can go about doing adventures, picking up pieces of gear that all of a sudden makes you uh, persona non grata or everyone's out to hunt you now to try and get that whatever it is that you have, that bauble, that weapon, that, that piece of tech that you have. Now that now the black market's out for you. Atlantis mm -hmm. is chasing you down. Shy town is interested to put that piece of kit into the Black Library, so nobody has access to it. Kind of like the Ark of the Covenant after uh, uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark. That kind of a thing, where keep it keep it small, keep it concentrated on your player characters. That's 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 the long and the short of it. It was said last week. We've said it a bunch of times in general, but I love it when other people say it, and you pretty much said it as well. But uh, uh, limitations breed imagination. I also liken it to the whole idea of necessity is the mother of invention. If you put limits on the characters, one of the reasons why I love the Earth Dawn game so much, those disciplines just come with inherent limitations. You must do certain things to be them. Well, you can do that as a game master here, not so much with the OCCs, but yeah, li limit, limit the character's access to anything outside the basics. And when they want that MacGuffin, exactly as, as Frank said there, what are the results of that? You got it. Now what? So I have no problem with a player that wants to play a character from, uh, let's say, the Japan book that was brought up. Mm -hmm. If you want to play a, a, a dragon bioborg or a dragon borg, um, you, know, you are a cyborg in the shape of a dragon. Okay, great. You know that that might be your shtick. You want to come over to North America where the setting is being played. You are now going to have limitations on who you can find to repair your systems who is going to accept you into their realm as a, uh, a you know, for, for lack of a better term, a, a, a safe space? Because w how do we disengage the weapons on a dragon Borg that has a mega damage plasma cannon in his mouth or, or something to that effect? Um, and, and then how are you going to be viewed by the locals? And you don't have any idea about the culture in North America. You are a, uh, a it's not like current setting where if you want to learn about japan you go onto the google you go onto the interwebs and you start asking questions and the the algorithm starts feeding you information that doesn't exist in rifts earth okay the global telecommunication network is gone 
Okay. If you are in North America, what you know about New German Republic or Japan or South America is entirely based on rumor and speculation. Or you've picked an OCC that has the skills and you are one of those few that has the knowledge to expand outwards from that. Okay. Um, in, in terms of uh, limitations, that's something the game master can play with. You want to play something from Japan? Sure. But you're going to be that dude that just walks into an unknown setting and you have absolutely no idea what the norms and the culture, uh, the cultural expectations are for people uh, of your type here in wh wherever that happens to be. And imagine what happens when that rumor mill gets to places like the coalition or the Splugorth. You're not on the other side of the world anymore. You're just a little ways away and mm, we may want to study this and you absolutely and 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 that is one of those things where as a game master or or me mentoring a game master i'd be like you know what you let him pick that dragon shaped bio borg you let him come over to north america now you've got i can just off the top of my head i can think of six plot arcs that you can develop and throw against the player characters in terms of what it is that they've got to deal with for adventures, um, just based on one character. Okay, that's not even including some of the other guys that are that that are sitting around the table. Uh, and you do the same thing with everybody else. But um, to start with, I would limit it to a region just to make it easier for everyone to understand uh, who's who in the zoo, so to speak, and to to kind of walk and talk crawl walk run your way through the rules before you uh you, you start running crawl then walk okay um let's move down to timothy ferrelli here uh, ask you the same question what are some of the main challenges you face when running a rifts game and how do you overcome them scheduling but no <laughs> be fair <laughs> being able to get everybody at the table that's a pain but um you get the Malachi and Frank. They've, you know, they've already said any, anything else that I would have said. Uh, it's um, I ran a fantasy game, and I allowed that to get away from me real fast. <laughs> oh man, they can, you gotta have those uh, those restrictions in place when you run the game. But I'm keeping this in Dinosaur Swamp. So. Dinosaur Swamp is survival gun <laughs> run amok. Uh, no, I, I love, see, I love survival games. I love post apocalyptic survival games where you are scrounging like that. So, Dinosaur Swamp wasn't just a book I was like, fine, I'll do for riffs. I, that's how I started off, but I ended up loving both books, The Adventures and the Dinosaur Swamps. So, here, I'll ask you this question then. And, and I know I didn't ask Frank a follow up question. That's because we have three primary questions this time, and I want to keep this moving. But, um, if Frank, if you want to jump in on this one as well, you can. But for Timothy, how do you handle the complexity of the rules and mechanics and riffs to ensure smooth gameplay? This was a tough one for some time, uh, especially when you have somebody who's a bit rules lawyery type. And they're like, oh, over here in this box, time out. <laughs> we're in this setting. All right. This is what we're going with. It's saying, you know, this skill is at this percentage because it applies to this setting. It, we're not dealing with uh, phase world. We're not dealing with fantasy. This is what we're going with. So stick with the settings. Stick with what makes sense for the setting. Um, and don't be afraid to say no. I, I, I would agree with a lot of that. Um, one of the things that, that I love about the world building in Rifts is that it, it's a term that I developed back in the day. Sanctioned ignorance is part <laughs> of the game okay you are not able or expected to have any knowledge outside of the little bubble the little sandbox that your character was developed into and all of a sudden we introduce a character from another section of the world you have absolutely no idea what this thing is and that's one of the things that i love about uh the palladium system as well is uh you don't necessarily need to tell each other what your occ is um, that's, that's one of the restrictions that I like to try and influence is like, okay, you're dealing with this guy and, and, and he, for all intents and purposes, looks to be just like any men at arms class, unless there is something about him that is very specific. He is completely bionically converted. Okay. 
99% chance he's a Borg. Okay. Um, but then if you look at somebody who is not and and then like practitioner of magic, you don't need to know necessarily that he's a ley line walker or that he's a mystic or that he is a temporal wizard or any of the other dozens of classes that are available. Um, reinforce that sanctioned ignorance in, in session zero before you get too far down the trace, so to speak, before you get into too many of those goose eggs of your adventure so that the players understand they are not expected to know everything about everything. It is... You are a level one headhunter. You're a level one mystic. You're a level one vagabond. You don't know what you don't know. Let's go adventuring and let me educate you. Let's 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 explore the world, and then you will discover my interpretation of it and your exploration of the world as I have crafted it, and then we just see where it goes from there. Um, in terms of things like preparation, though. One of the things that I like to do, um, and, and this is part of adventure design, and it's very, very simple. Um, part of the problem is when you look at a Rifts book and you look at the NPC section, some of those NPCs can be an entire page or more. Okay, They go into a lot of things. When you're creating an NPC or you're creating a MOOC that you're going to have an engagement with, you don't need to know every single one of that character's skills you don't need to know any of the skills. If that character engagement is supposed to be a shoot 'em up combat scenario, I don't care at all about their skills. Uh, or if it comes up, I'll just assign a random percentile to somebody that has to do something. Okay, a lore skill or a um, a, a non combat skill. I'll just make it up as I go. What about but carpentry, I need to know if he's a carpenter. Uh, you, you don't need to know about that in a combat scenario. Um, but when you're designing scenarios and you're designing NPCs, and this is something that I was going to get into in a couple of blog posts, um, you need to you need to first design what the, the objective of that NPC is in terms of furthering the adventure. Um, what are they going to impart to the NPCs? If they're going to provide a skill set, then yes, you need to develop what that percentile is going to be, what it looks like, how they're going to interact with characters. Uh, but if it's just a bunch of monsters, all you need is baseline MDC. You just need a couple of their weapon systems. And then before the encounter starts, just a couple of notes that says, this monster is going to go after the biggest, meanest looking character in the group. Or it's going to go after the weakest looking character in the group. And then you go from there. And then you let the characters develop how they want that encounter to look like. Are the... Are the heavy hitters all of a sudden going to start stepping in front of attacks to save the vagabond or the wilderness scout because he's the only guy that knows how to cook fish and uh, wilderness survival and nobody has that skill? Okay, that might be the guy that is the most important to the group, not the Borg, not the glitter boy. Okay, they might finish the combat faster, but the entire survival of the group is dependent on the squishy that is only sitting in maybe... Uh, you know, 30 MDC armor, um, and 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 off you go. Um, so yeah. Well, the, well, the authors, a moron. Um, there's a great book out there, and while it was written for fifth edition D and D, I suggest it for any game master of any game. Like I, I've, I'll use it even for my AD and D second edition games if uh, uh, if it comes up. But it's called The Monsters Know What They're Doing. Yep. And it's a great way to look at what it does. What that what that it's, written kind of as a novel because it goes through like all the creatures that were in 5e at least some you know the monster manual books um is it talks about look at their stats look at the special abilities look at the things that they can do now how would that creature act and and one of the things like uh like you said and we did this in the past before that book was done but but it's prevalent lions go after the weakest prey and it's just a dumb animal so is it going to attack the paladin in you know nice shiny armor? I know we're talking riffs here, but just go with me for the medieval thing for now. Or is it going to go after the wizard that's wearing a little robe and I can smell his nice little flesh parts right now? Um, so you know we did little tricks like have the paladin limp. So if it attacks, it sees that as the as the uh, the more appropriate prey. It it inspires. I don't want to call it tactical thinking, but we'll call it, you know, survivalist tactical thinking in that. But you can take a book like that, or you don't even need the book. Just spend some time looking at the monster like, oh, this thing flies. How many times is it going to land on the ground? Well, considering it's big and dangerous, 
Maybe never. Why would it? Why should it? Unless, oh, it only has short range attacks. Well, then maybe it's going to hide under the swamp like an alligator and just wait for you to, you know, think about how it can attack. And you can make some of the most mundane creatures crazy dangerous. Yep. That was actually one of the uh, segments in my blog. Um, where I'm do- going to be doing deep dives into characters in the bestiary and some of the books uh, to provide GMs some idea of how to employ this. Uh, and it's very much based on that book. Awesome. Um, and I have one up there. It's the first one in, and it talks about a coalition squad. And it talks about the various ways to use and, and just start with a baseline coalition squad and how would they go about doing an ambush? How would they go about a section attack? How would they go about doing a defensive? Um, so that the game master can use that in terms of, we got to break into a coalition fort. Well, what does that look like? Okay, well, now the coalition is out on patrol. What does that look like? Oh, the coalition's going to ambush you now. What does that look like? Uh, in terms of how the rules are written and how you can use it to develop your own adventures. Um, interestingly enough, uh, you know, a coalition platoon, um, if you were to do it right, has absolutely no problem taking out a fully grown dragon in rifts. Okay. If you know what you're doing and, and this is assuming there's horror factor in the rest of it. Okay. Mm -hmm. If you're playing them right, if you want to play them like a bunch of star Trek red shirts, where they're the ones that just die, they're just a bunch of walking targets. That's fine. That's perfectly viable. But I would suggest that there is more to them than just giving them, uh, you know, mook targets on their back and then watch them run away and shoot them in the back. Yeah, the coalition wouldn't be as powerful as it is and have as much territory as it does if they were all morons. And animals, however you want to look at it, sure, you can say things that have rifted in might be confused or whatever because they're on a new planet. But ultimately speaking, animals have, have through natural selection and evolution, gotten their capabilities they can do what they can do and now we're in a world that's a couple hundred years later after mutations and so on and so forth they know how to use those abilities they're not just gonna be a derp 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 uh and and and, i don't know i kind of think it's two-dimensional gaming if people do that but let's move on to the next question and we're going to start with frank on this one which is how do you manage the vast amount of lore and information the rifts my god you already said you had 36 books behind you and that's not even what half the entire rifts collection if i remember correctly so how how do you manage that without overwhelming the players yeah there's 36 world books there's like a half dozen conversion books and source books dimension books i think they're up to about 18 now right so there's no point in even trying to get in this game because i can't spend a thousand dollars to try to try to do this And, and in all honesty i wouldn't even suggest you try um, at that level, because because quite fr- like if you were to look at the books behind me, I'm I'm a bit of a collectionist. Okay, I've got a lot of books behind me that I would not expect any new GM to get. Okay, I would actually reinforce not getting because certain books behind me on that shelf. Uh, you know, the the perfect example is like the Index One and Two. Okay, the Index books when they were written had a purpose. They are way very important outdated. purpose. Yeah, they are way outdated. So, um, in when I create uh, an adventure in terms of uh, new, specifically for new players, I'm going to create a pre-see document. I'm going to create a, a, a an intro to the setting, and it is basically summarizing the major events that the PCs are going to be aware of, uh, that ties into the background of their story, sets the setting in terms of what year post a cop post-apocalypse we are, where we are, why we're adventuring, where we're going. So it gives them some concept for character development. Uh, and then I provide certain annexes, uh, and, and and this sounds like a lot of work, but I mean, it, it doesn't have to be. A one-pager is fine. But then I also bring in the PC details that they develop through their character generation. And then I start picking those nuggets out and I say, okay, you're from a set different section of Rifts Earth? Okay, I'm going to start teasing out some information on what it is I can take from your character's development to apply into the adventure module that we are going to play, or a second slash third adventure. It might not be a pertinent plot point right now. We're going to go dive into the shopping mall that somebody's discovered, and you are being contracted to go explore. Or you're going to be the security for the dude because he thinks there's something out there to go explore and you're going to go dive into it. Um, but but 
the session zero is largely where I would discuss a lot of those, the, the Precy documents. So if we're going to section off uh, North America, we're going to be in the eastern seaboard, south of Free Quebec, but north of the Dino Swamp. Okay, this is where we are. I'll give you a quick map. Uh, and this is what's going on in terms of Free Quebec, the Federation of Magic, what's in the Dino Swamp, and what you know about Atlantis off the coast. But the rest of it is wide open. You don't know nothing. OK, or what you do know, you have absolutely no basis to reinforce with fact. It's based off rumors uh, and rumors are something that I love exploiting in terms of world building and in terms of um, not necessarily pissing off my players, uh, <laughs> giving them giving them something that they don't like. They, they sometimes they chomp onto something that is yep. absolutely useless. But but that's but that's awesome because people do that in the real world. People will yep. believe some of the dumbest crap, no matter how much you convince them, because you were there or, or whatever. Yep. There's like, nope, this is what was really going on. Okay, you know, sure. Yep. And, and sanctioned ignorance is something that I am very much. Uh, I I love reinforcing sanctioned ignorance. If you're going to play a coalition character, you are going to start with a series of world viewpoints that we are going to discuss that I expect your character to go with, okay? And in terms of the start point, that's where I expect it. If you develop that character into something different, that's perfectly fine. That is perfectly that's great. Viable. Absolutely. But if you stick with it and you want to stay, like, no, this is my character and this is how he's going to deal with everything he comes into contact, that's fine too. I will take every bit of information. This is, communication is a two-way street, Okay. I will take what you feed me in terms of your reactions to what I am putting in front of you, and I will think two, three steps ahead of you. And I will start developing little notes on a sheet of paper in terms of adventure design on what I am going to look to throw at you maybe two, three weeks from now. Maybe not tonight, but two, three weeks from now, you gave me that nugget, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw it in your face. Like I am going to exploit that to the max. If you're uh, stubborn, oh yeah, stubborn. I love exploiting stubbornness. Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. Uh, um, and 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 I also I, I don't limit them reading all the different world books because quite frankly, there's a lot of great stuff to read. Kevin uh, wrote a lot of great books in terms of immersion and the ability to get in and 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 have fun with the setting. Uh, I like to think I did a decent enough job with Free Quebec um, in terms of the coalition war and a group of humans that are set apart from the coalition states. They've got a similar way of thinking, but they're a little bit rebellious and they've got their own problems to deal with. Um, but, but you can take that kind of a concept and run with it anywhere across Rift. There is no limitations, but I would start with some just so that you could get into that um, and, and, and have fun with a small, sized sandbox and move from there okay well lucky you you answered your follow-up question <laughs> so, uh, no no that's good that just means that that we're on the same page so i'll i'll jump on down to uh, timothy frelly here uh again same main question how do you manage the vast amount of lore and information in the risk universe to avoid overwhelming your players it's irrelevant you know you are where you are at most you're going to know maybe what's going on in your town. And the the only uh oh, what's the, word? the the only ones that would know more would probably be the a coalition citizen would know uh what's going on elsewhere because they have the technology. Um I could see the Fed Magic being able to provide some additional information because again they developed their they have a develop, develop infrastructure. Beyond that, not you're not going to know what's going on. You're not going to know the ins and outs. Of, you're not going to know about um, Juicer Uprising too much. And you might not even know what happened at all. So you, you just you don't know. Simple as that. On a broader scale, what techniques do you use to integrate the various genres? You know, fantasy, sci-fi, horror. Basically, Rifts covers everything, right? You can integrate all of it. So how do you how do you integrate that in seamlessly into a single campaign? That is, well, uh, conversion books, uh, first off. 
Well, I mean, Music we're not necessarily talking books. about the other game. We don't have, we don't have to talk about Nightbane or whatever. Just just the concepts of horror, because everybody thinks of riffs as you know post apocalyptic and so forth. But you can absolutely add elements in it. Um, I think it's in Dinosaur Swamp. You got those ghost people out there, those Civil War that's yep. yes, that yeah. creepy people. Uh, you got the was it the children or babies yeah. or whatever they are. Like, uh, come on, tell, tell tell me if that isn't done well, that isn't creepy as heck. <laughs> it's yeah uh beyond the conversion books it's just a matter of excuse me um incorporating it in the story um and you know making it pertinent to what you're doing okay malachi you awake sir Sit yep. in the shadow, sleeping in the back. Uh, how do you manage the vast amount of lore and information in the rifts universe to avoid overwhelming your players uh, I mean, I, Timothy nailed it. You're just going to worry about where the group is at, you know, your little section of the world. They're really not going to know much about the bigger dealings going on, like between Triax and the Coalition States. And heck, even so, maybe I changed it on you. I'm the GM. I can do that. So how, how would you keep the game in, engaging for both new players and veterans? You know, th- now you had a good point there with the changing of some stuff. Well, I'm a veteran. I know everything about the world. <laughs> Those are rumors, buddy. Yeah. Um, you know, h- how, how do you keep it engaging for both veterans and new players? Hmm. Well, I mean, the new players is pretty easy. Just about anything can catch their eye, you know, uh, just really knowing what the, uh, player enjoys doing the kind of stories he involves getting involved in, you know, the kinds of character he characters he play plays, kind of NPCs he likes to interact with, just h- focusing in on his preferences. All right, uh, let's see. What we have for some anything that you guys wanted to bring up to each other. Any any commentary you wanted to make on the, the questions there? Else, I'm gonna read some super chats. We'll move into the next question. I was just gonna say that. Like, in, in, in terms of new players or, or, or even more veterans, um, one of the things that I found that, that, that might be uh, a, a scalable approach is you take uh, veterans and you pop them into a different part of North America or a different part of Europe and scale down the adventure so that it is a, a more discreet, um, small scale, limited impact adventure uh, and then build it up from there. Um, You don't need to necessarily be uh, influencing geopolitical decision making with your adventures and and veterans sometimes I think find probably that that might be a very um, fresh take on what it is that people are doing in terms of their gaming uh, by giving them something that is not necessarily influencing the you know how Emperor Prosec is looking at the world. Uh, or invading Atlantis and and doing some kind of a major uh, prison break uh, of the, uh, the the market or or what have you, um, I I find that to be probably one of the best ways to refresh a campaign is to give them something off to the side, throw them on a tangent, make it a one off. It, it doesn't have to be a full blown three month campaign, uh, but give them something new. And give them something discreet. And hey, it might just be that you know one of the new villains might be that shifter that throws them into not a parallel dimension, but a pocket dimension where they now have to re-explore the world. They have to figure out what the cultural norms are and then figure out, okay, is this a futuristic setting? Is this a modern setting? Is this an ancient setting? Now I've got a bunch of laser guns that might make me a god here right up until i stop uh right up until i run out of energy clips <laughs> okay but i can't now just plug them into the wall like my ipad what the hell you know, all right, I, I, unless you got that guy that is able to run a metal coil off the top of a mountain and hit that bolt of lightning to recharge your energy clip whatever that might you know that solution might look like um you know you can you can really uh throw some twists and turns at your players and rifts provides you all those elements to play with. Wait, wait, wait. Energy clip holds energy, right? My laser gun, it's energy, right? So if I just shoot it, it should recharge. Yeah, no. <laughs> oh. <Yep. laughs> all right. Uh, I don't know why I'm 
It's riffs, man. I'm just trying to think of weird stuff. <laughs> All right, where are we here? Uh, so we're going to start off with a comment here where uh, uh, Frank up there says, I was not a fan of the riffs Game Master Guide. And before you, before you make your comment on that, neither yeah. was I, but I don't remember why. I remember going through the, the riffs Game Master's Guide and the Heroes Unlimited Game Master Guide and saying the Heroes Unlimited Game Master Guide was so much better. Two different books. And, and I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, it specifically... The, the Rifts Game Master Guide, it, it's not that it's a bad book. Like I, It's not that I would say don't ever get it. Um, I would not recommend a new Game Master look at the Game Master Guide because it doesn't do what you would expect a Game Master Guide to do. It is a tech guide for all the different pieces of gear, and even then it's truncated. And so rehashed a whole, like all the skills. Why? <laughs> Yeah, it, so like if you're looking for a robot and, and, and you're set in North America and you're looking for a robot from New Germany, you'll find a Triax robot, but you'll only find maybe the main body and the arms and the legs, but you won't have the main body for everything. You don't have all the stats for those weapons. You don't have all the stats for what the robot can do, um, but you have something, okay? But when you think Game Master Guide, that's not what you're looking for. The Rift's Adventure Guide, however, that is a definitive uh, 10 out of 10 recommendation. Yes. That realistically is why I was not a fan of the Game Master Guide because, A, I have the books, so I don't need the Game Master Guide to give me uh, the truncated versions of the robots and, and, and whatnot. Uh, I have the books for that. Where I would say is the Adventure Guide is a much better resource for particularly even even experienced GMs, new mm -hmm. GMs, it's a gold mine. It and it's such a small book too. It's just like it's just jam packed yeah. with information. It is. I mean, when you look at it, it is like uh, where did it go? Oh, where did you go? It's right here. So this book here, this book here is by far. Um, after the Ultimate Edition book, uh, or the main book, if you want to get that, um, it is definitely the second book that I would recommend to any new Game Master uh, to Rifts to buy. But yours looks different than mine. I thought mine was skinnier. Eh, whatever, uh, I'm not going to... This, this is the hardbound version. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, let me go back to the chat. I almost skipped the Super Chats. Uh, do we have Super Chats? Where am I? Where... Ah, comments. Boom. There we go. All right. Uh, next was uh, what it means to be. Did we read this one? Um, just in case we didn't, I'm going to put it up there. Did we read this one? As previously mentioned, make the characters understand what it means to be a juicer. Or full... I don't think we did. So thank you for the $10, Law Dog. And if we already read it, don't care. We're going to do it again. My brain's not working, apparently. So we're going to pretend like we didn't if we did. But I don't think so. As was previously mentioned, make the characters understand what it means to be a juicer or a full conversion Borg, or a shifter whose sanity is slowly eroded by regular contact with alien beings. I, I, I mean, there's constant, I mean, Kevin talks, but we have a bunch of shorts that we made out of that, all that stuff. But I think we have an entire video on that that we kind of put together where Kevin just talks about consequences. And, you know, Frank has mentioned a whole ton of them as well. They, think of the fallout, let them have their little victory. And then comes the next stage of the campaign, or especially if you have a, a, like me, I like to run never ending campaigns, just play until people stop showing up. So it could be months and years that we're playing the game. That's just great content. They just gave you content. Awesome. Good job. Thanks, guys. <laughs> uh, Poly Robotics says Riff's main book plus a setting book. This is what Heathen Dog says as well Riff's plus one. I didn't star it, but Nerd, Nerd Yogurt said, you don't even need that. Just Rift's Ultimate Edition plus page 248. Fair enough. <laughs> Law Dog for $2 says, uh, Palladium is worse than Pokemon. Gotta get them all. <laughs> that's fair. You know, and, and that's the thing, is as the not Rift's guy, right, I still love the Rift's world books. I mean, there are some of them that I've, like, I have zero interest in Vampire Kingdoms, zero interest in Africa. Um, but I'm really looking forward to the Antarctica one that's coming out. I love the Dinosaur Swamp books, Mystic Russia and, and uh, Sovietsky. Of course, I got kind of a background in Russian history. But, you know, I, 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 there are world books out there that are absolutely fantastic. So if there's a particular part of the world you like or a particular concept, and by the way, those Russian robots, 
they look like what you think from the Soviet era. And then the Russian magic is just as creepy as Slavic magic. So, yeah, I mean, it it, it all works out. And, oops, not, why'd that scroll me? And there we go. Ah, I'm from Over the Pond, but Legion of Myth is one of the true dedicated TTRPG channels. Probably wouldn't have said that a couple years ago, but I appreciate that. Here in Europe, I'm lucky to catch them live. Well, you know what? I lived in Germany for 11 years, and I wasn't on the show for a few years of those because it was at 2 in the morning for me. So I get it. I appreciate you being here. I really do. So thank you, thank you, thank you. I, I like that. The reason I put that comment up there isn't just a Pat Legion of Myth back. It's the fact that, you know... I'm showing that because I'd still have people complaining that we don't rant enough anymore. It preferred me when I was screaming about Watsi or whatever. And, you know, that could happen sometime in the future. It's just not in the plans right now because I just have no desire anymore. I just don't care. And I love these more gaming centric with that great panel like we have on today. I just want to keep doing this. I'm having fun with this. So I'm glad you guys are as well. Now, let's go on to, uh, yes, that's right, this is a special segment. We get three questions this time. And who am I on? I am on. I wrote it down this time. Uh, I'm on Timothy Ferrelli. Not that it matters. I can start with the same person every time. It wouldn't really matter, but, you know, I like to be fair. All right. I'm going to ask this generally, and your follow-up is going to be a specific one. So, so, Timothy, Palladium isn't all honey and roses. It isn't all Borgs and juicers. I don't know. Dragons. <laughs> Cyber knights. Cosmo knights. Whatever. There are some bad things, maybe. So how do you handle some of the negative sentiment towards the Palladium system? Uh, acknowledge it's there, you know, you know, the, the, for, the inconsistent format. Yes, it, it is inconsistent. And um, it, it's supposed to be, And other than that, a lot of it is just personal uh, preference or even possibly even ignorance. And if it's, if somebody, if it's ignorance, you know, you just help them along. You, you show them why they're wrong. Um, and if they, then you just move on. Um, I also like to, you know, start people like for, uh, new players. I like to grab new players, start with a campaign out of the, um, well, out of one of the books and give them pre baked characters and just go with it. it it's going to it may very well turn into a wackadoodle adventure. But it gets them started, and they like they like the setting, they like the uh, the rule set, and with that, you can expand and move forward. So education and and uh, sometimes acknowledgement, yeah, formatting is inconsistent. But with Sean, I hope that's getting better. I see it's getting better. It, it, well, I mean, as somebody who's seen the team and T stuff, it is better. Um, yeah. I mean, I have I have my one issue with it, but we won't go into that. Um, I'm going to save the actual specifics. I'm going to have all, all of you guys comment. I'm going to kind of lightning round you guys in that. But it's funny that you should whack a doodle because I think you've been on the show before because I say that word a lot. Uh, so, so I'm glad it's catching on. All right. Uh, Malachi, same thing for you. How do you handle some of the negative sentiment towards Palladium System? Well, one of the and this is more of a general thing I've come across is a lot of people don't like to roll for stats. Lack but of what? That people don't like to roll their stats in like D and D and maybe really, yeah. Oh my god, yeah. The bane of my existence. It's not that, fair. That, that stoop. Okay, never mind. The D twenty <laughs> system where you, y'all. You, I'm just gonna take an eighteen. I'm gonna take a sixteen. I'm gonna take a fourteen. Stat right. Whatever, whatever that is. I I understand the why. But that's because of the way their system is developed. Right. Well, that system is developed way more on the bonuses and penalties. So that kind of so it's not balanced. But uh, in Palladium, you got to be 12. Depends on which book you have. But generally speaking, you have between a 3 and 15 or a 6 and 15. And you're the same. You're just the same. Who cares? Yeah. But go, go ahead, Malachi. Sorry. Go ahead and finish. Yeah. But once I explained to him, you know, that you have to roll for the stats because that's how you get your bonus if you're not playing human. You know, that there really aren't any penalties for low stats, and it's yeah. more for just getting your OCC. They they come around, they get the, you know, they get, they're, they're okay with it. And it helps now, you role play your character in a cinematic style. Yeah. Now, I, you do have about Kevin being a poo poo meanie head, as you put it, on the questions. <laughs> and I know he was very um, lawsuit ha heavy in the 90s, very protective of his IP, but I think. Part of that was when the internet started really taking off, you didn't know 
how your stuff was protected or if it was protected at the time. So you had to do these things to to safeguard your creation. I, mean, I was watching a show and I don't remember what it is. Uh, I, 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 I always have something going on in the background when you guys streaming or something else. And somebody was talking about a similar situation. It wasn't for Palladium Books. But uh, it was like, no, they had to sue. That was the only way to protect their IP. So even if they didn't want to sue, they had to, else you lose the, the whatever aspect of the IP it was. So, yeah. And it's also you're all, when you sue and you get to court, if it's something brand new, you're setting a precedent for the future so that this mm -hmm. doesn't have to happen again. All right. Well, I'll jump into the, the again. I, I will lightning round the, a few things that people complain about in a bit. So we'll we'll finish up with Frank on the general question. Here is how do you handle some of the negative sentiment towards Palladium System? Oh, but the, I want, I'm going to change this up on you. Yep. Sorry. You, go ahead. I, I know you kind of prepared your answers and so forth, but uh, no, but but I want to I want to specifically, if you can, dive into people who complain about free Quebec. I'll answer the the the, the general question first. Sure. Um, in terms of, uh, you know, uh, opinion about the Palladium system, I, I, I will just shrug my shoulders and go, meh, because quite frankly, a lot of the issues that they bring up, I can reverse and say the exact same thing as a problem in whatever their favorite system is. Give me a D20 system, a D10 or a D6 or a 2D20 system, and the problems you have with Palladium system... I can find or replicate to uh, an even greater degree in your system. Uh, the D20 system is an easy one. The challenge rating uh, is not a system that does what it's supposed to do, particularly at higher level characters. Okay. Um, it, it just doesn't work. The feet tech tree. And if you create a system that is so um, uh, manipulated or man, uh, malleable that you can find the ultimate tech tree path to create the ultimate cleric or ultimate whatever. Um, I find that to be uh, limiting in terms of what players can then expect uh, in terms of an immersive experience. Because now if they don't go and follow that specific tech tree, they are not playing the game necessarily, quote unquote, the way it was supposed to be played. Okay. And that is a very, like, Look, you go onto YouTube and you start asking questions about how do I play an effective ranger or how can I create a cleric for a D20 system? And you'll find a multitude of D, uh, like a, a D20 YouTube channels that will uh, not necessarily berate you, but you'll find comments that will berate you for not playing the tech tree ultimate path, whatever that looks like. Um, and, and, and that works in the D20 system. I'm not saying that that's a bad way to go. Um, but, but it does provide a, a disincentive for some of those people coming into the system to create something that works for them. Um, as far as Rifts is concerned, you know, the antiquated game design, incoherent rules, there's some merit to that. You know, I'm not going to, I don't, I don't wear the rose colored glasses when I talk about my reviews of books. Okay. I have reviewed some of the Palladium books and given them the three out of 10, the four out of 10. Okay. Um, but but that was because, and I explained my reasons why. Um, could they do with an editing pass for brevity? Absolutely. Uh, my best example is the missile combat system. Uh, in Rift's Ultimate Edition, I think it's four pages. Uh, really? In my version, it's one column of one page. Missile combat system, roll to hit. <laughs> it, uh, if four or more come at you, you're not dodging? Co no, roll it's, damage. <laughs> it's four pages long, and that's before you get to the table of the different missiles. Um, but there's, there's wow. other examples like that where, uh, yes, at the time it made sense because it provided you the in-depth, uh, knowledge that you needed for, I see Malachi looking for the missiles, the rules. um, but it, it provided you what you needed. Um, but then it, it, it was, it's more wordy than it needed to be in current context. What the current players are looking for is more brief, more point form. Um, and that can be done. An editing pass could fix a lot of things and normalize the rules so that the rules that you're playing in TMNT are the same that you will find in Rifts, are the same that you will find in Dead Rain, are the same that you will find in any of the other systems. 
Um, and there are ways to, 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 to transfer one to the next. Uh, Kevin is amazing when it comes to writing lore, story, creativity, and so forth. Yep. He needs a peer technical writer to write the rule the, the, we'll call it the encyclopedic part of the book i don't think that's in his wheelhouse he's too good of a writer outside of that where he needs somebody with that other side of the brain to sit there and do do the actual just rules compilation portion and, and i've talked with sean about this and i and i don't think i'm speaking out of turn uh in terms of my conversation with sean um that is something that they are looking at like a keyword index that that provides you the basis for a ruling in terms of how a character does a thing here should be the same in all the other systems. Uh, it's an unfortunate holdover, the older publishing uh, mechanics, where they would have the old uh, stamp sheets, that they, the mm -hmm. negatives that they would provide, that they would cut out sheets of paper, paste them, and, and do the negatives. Um, that, that was from back in the day. And, and of course, technology has evolved now. It is all PDFs. It is all, it's all electronic. Uh, stealth updates for skills and combat and other rules, they do exist. But guess what? None of those updates are game-breaking enough that if you wanted to come into Rifts and you held on to Rifts Ultimate Edition, Adventure Guide, and maybe a couple of other books, you don't need to know about the cowboy skill section, which I think is something that needs to go away the dinosaur. <laughs> yeah, we I think everybody says that. Yeah. I mean, actually, I would it should belong in New West, but for that setting. No, it should really really if you look at the skills in the cowboy section, it is a bunch of uh, horsemanship skills that belong with the other horsemanship skills in the horsemanship section. Oh, I didn't realize that. Lore skills, lore Indian, lore, 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 yeah, the different lore skills, throw those with the other technical skills. And there's, I think, maybe one or two science skills. But all of them hmm, belong okay. in other categories that already exist. That, that's why the, the first thing I would do is get rid of Cowboy from any thought moving forward. Um, skills and, and, and in terms of low skills and what, what would you expect a first character to be able to do a first level character to be able to do certain characters are going to be better at things than others, but a first level character in any system is not going to challenge the gods. They are not going to be able to change the strategic outlook of any kingdom or setting or, or major plot muscle movement within the setting or the system that you're using. So don't expect a first level character to change the world. That's the first thing I would say. Uh, and then build up to it. Now, Kevin being a mini poo-poo head, I, I honestly I had to laugh a lot at this one um, because I was around and I was very active at the time that Free Quebec came out on the Palladium uh, website's chat room. Oh, and, God. And I was on the Palladium website's uh, message boards. And um, this was... Uh, I could not spend any time there because I felt like the people who were supposed to play and like Palladium hated Palladium. I was like, okay. It, it was it was largely a reaction to them being put, maybe put in their place for, for legitimate reasons that we've kind of touched on. Most of those issues never affected me. This was Palladium Books' heyday. A lot of people were looking at Palladium Books, and there were conversions for other books that had IP protection involvement. And... If you put that onto the Palladium message boards, at the time, IP law for something like this was still being developed. So there was a lot of people that were quick to react, quick to sue, and Palladium was in a position where they were vulnerable to a lot of mega corporations coming in and saying, you are supporting conversions of our IP into your system, we do not approve. Like, uh, you know, you had comic book conversions, you had Star Wars conversions, you had a, all, a whole host of different things. There, it, It's a much different dynamic now. Mm -hmm. Okay, the IP world and the OGL, quite frankly, one of the best things that ever happened, the OGL opened things up and loosened a lot of people's interpretations for IP protection. Um, I'm not an IP lawyer, so I'm not going to say that you could just go about and do your conversions and off you go. Um, but when we had the enforcement back in the day when like Marianne was uh, on the boards and she was very, very kept a close eye on things. Uh, I had a GeoCities website back in the day for those that remember what those looked like. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I've had certain, you know, several conversations with Sean and a few with Kevin 
with respect to other things that 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 Palladium has been blamed about reference delivery and and their publishing schedule and and the way that they go about their business I like to think that I've gained their trust in terms of our conversations and and what I have kept close hold um, and then you know not that I'm keeping any secret um, but but the conversations that I've had with them were very very positive um, and and in terms of some of the reactions and the people that talk about negatively towards palladium I think they probably are, are coming from a position that they don't know what they don't know. Uh, they don't know what they don't know about IP laws and the protections that had to be in place back in the day where you had to sue to maintain your IP protection. There was a game that came out that was called uh, Rift. Uh, what is it? It was just Rift. Um, it was an the, the MMORPG? Yeah, the MMORPG. Yeah, yes. I played it. <laughs> yeah, and 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 they came out and they had to protect their IP because the idea was pretty much one in the same. It didn't go the way that I think Kevin would have wanted it to go, um, and and I don't know enough about that to to speak to it. Um, but I do know that there were some things that developed in their history that didn't go the way some people wanted. Uh, in some cases, for legitimate reasons, and for many other cases. Um, I would suggest most people don't know the history or the details to, to, to be able to speak with any kind of clarity on the scenario that they, they might be complaining about. Um, there, there's a number of things I could get into. I won't yeah, but every, everybody thinks that they're smarter than they are. I mean, I'm, I know I fall into this as well. They, they think they're smarter than they are. Well, I, I know because I heard from this guy who heard from that guy who heard from this other guy who didn't play operator at all. You know, yeah. like, uh, And I read it on the Internet, so it must be true. Um, you know, no, and, and, and if my and if my buddy Jim doesn't like Kevin, if he said that Kevin said a poo poo word to him, then Kevin must have done it. And you know, I don't like Kevin either. You know, it's yeah. it's a lot of that going on. And and you know, like when I went through the process of writing Free Quebec, to bring it back to the question that you wanted to pose, um, I threw in a uh, a scenario or a a suggested manuscript oh, uh, draft. And I said, okay, Kevin, here's, here's, here's what I'm thinking, and here are the sections that I've fleshed out, and here are the sections that I'm going to flesh out if you give me permission to carry on. And he did. And he was, he was jazzed up with what I was suggesting. So I provided him pretty much um, what I thought would be free Quebec in terms of post-coalition war going, uh, you know, the coalition war campaign book. It was a great start point. It, it gave me a, a pretty easy start point in terms of what I needed to think about, in terms of gear, in terms of what we would consider the start state based on what was in the main book, and in terms of coalition war campaign. And there wasn't really much else uh, to talk about Free Quebec. So I, I, I developed you know, some new glitter boys, some new glitter boy tactics, which involved juicers and borgs, which the coalition wasn't very happy about. And I said, you know what? I'm going to take my military training and I'm going to apply a bit of rigor to the way that the coalition uh, uh, doesn't understand what free Quebec does in terms of their military. So I took combat tactics. I took, um, you know, combined arms tactics and I applied it to the way that they created the uh, free Quebec legions uh, and leveraged juicers and Borgs and the rest of it in terms of how they go about doing things. Everyone talked about, Oh, well, all you, get, all you got to do is shoot the boom gun and the glitter boy is pretty much useless. How do you do that? Just shoot four missiles at the boom gun. It's good to go. Well, guess what? I'm going to attach maybe uh, four glitter boys at a time. So there's always four of them. And guess what? There's always a bunch of juicers and borgs that are going to be supporting them whenever they go out. So it's a very concentrated, very powerful, but concentrated strike force. And guess what? Some of those Borgs and Juicers are only on defensive duty. All they're doing is shooting missiles out of the sky. That's all they're doing because their range is not anywhere near what the boom gun does. The boom gun reaches out for miles. A laser rifle only reaches out what? Maybe 6,000 feet, feet, I think it is, or yeah. 1,200 feet, whatever that is. And if you've got like a bunch of Juicers, which are hepped up on the drugs, like you were saying, and they got all these bonuses to shooting, and you got a bunch of Borgs with their own weapons. All they got to do is protect the main offensive force, and all they got to do is start pumping out 3d6 times 10 shots 
at whatever it is they're looking at. Um, so, and there was also a bunch of all, you know, the different cultural aspects of free Quebec compared to coalition writ large. Um, but in terms of people that complained about free Quebec, I, I gotta be honest. I, I don't necessarily think I've, I've heard any okay. legitimate, like le not legitimate, but like nobody's come out and given me a detailed explanation for why they don't like free Quebec. Oh, fair enough. Okay. I, I didn't know. I, I, I just assumed that everybody on the internet complains I'm about sure everything. So, you know, exist. I'm sure they exist. There's You're going gonna to get some... them now. Your link's in the description. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, okay. I'm going to go with Law Dog. Free Quebec was a great book. Yes, Yeah, it there was. you go. Go read so, it. Um, I only actually have ever read one complaint about Free Quebec, really. That's There's too many Glitter Boy barbers in it. <laughs> There's not enough. You know, you know what? There's too much in the Juicer Uprising book. Too many juicers. <laughs> yeah. There's the there main is... Glitter Boy. There's the uh, Glitter Boy that they got from NGR. There's the Tartarus, which was like the artillery piece. Uh, there's one more for the life of me. I can't remember the name, and I'm, I'm kicking myself now that I can't remember it. And then there was the Glitter Girl. And to be honest, the Glitter Girl, I, I don't recall submitting that as part of my submission. I have no idea where that one came from. Um, but the idea of it, and, and quite frankly, like the Glitter Boy is the main damage dealer, the Glitter Girl is the support piece. It makes sense, okay? Uh, she like that armor is there to be that like the like close air protection, uh, the cap patrol for the Glitter Boy Legion as they go out in the field. Um, they are not there to do the main damage against the enemy robots, the main protagonist that the uh, coalition was going to send, like the Abolisher robots and, uh, you know, all of those big stompy robots that were going to run through Col uh, Free Quebec. Nah, that wasn't going to happen. Sidekick. That's the other one. What's that? Sidekick. Yeah. That was one of the things about Free Quebec that, um, to, to go on a bit of a tangent, Free Quebec has a problem with psychics. They do no, no, not, no. they are even more problematic in terms of, uh, racism isn't the right word, but um, they, they have problems with dog boys, they have problems with psychics, and they, they follow the coalition in terms of magic is bad. Okay. Um, in, in some cases, Free Quebec is even worse than the coalition in terms of being uh, bad actors for non-humans, if I could put it that way. Um, I didn't go down that rabbit hole because, quite frankly, I think that was something for the GMs to develop. Um, I, I, I certainly wouldn't have gone back in time and made a point to reinforce that any more than I did. No, I you're think saying the, the, other, the other glitter boy was the sidekick. The yeah, that's the, yeah. Okay, I mean, we don't have to label them all off. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I got it. Um, all right. I, I do want to get back on uh, back on uh, a point here. I didn't realize that I'd sent you guys the the points that I was going to say. I just looked it up and I was like, oh, I did send it because he was answering like all the like I was going to lightning around this. So how does he know what I'm? At? Oh, I guess I did send you guys because I have it in my format. Here is the follow up questions. But so we will we will lightning round this portion of it um and i and i picked the five five uh, most prevalent ones that came up a lot especially in, in when i was asking questions so the first one is this oh my god mega damage is insane and by the way this is something where frank and i completely disagree um but uh you know mega damage is insane I, I don't get mega damage and so forth how do you guys handle the concept of mega damage I use Giga Damage? No. Oh, <laughs> yeah, Giga Damage. Giga That's Damage. I mean, yeah. it's, it's the equivalent, you know, the example that I saw one time in one of the books. You know, there's a tank. You shoot yeah. the tank with an Uzi. You're not going to damage it. Simple as that. So it, 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 it's, a thing, it's a thing. Yep. I I will say I I have a couple of tweaks that I apply to MDC. Uh, MDC, uh, and, and, and there's, a, there's a bunch of other nuanced rules that go to this. Um, I like to take MDC is SDC times 10, but I also give mega damage structures and anything with MDC an armor rating based off of their main body's, uh, their main body's value uh, up to a maximum of 15. 
So like in the terms of like, let's say, uh, you know, like a, a, a dead boy armor, uh, it starts at 10 and then you add one for every hundred points of main body rounded down. So a dead boy armor that has 80 MDC has a mega damage armor rating of 10. A glitter boy, 770, does not have a mega damage armor rating of 17. It, it caps out at 15. And the way that I, the way that I work it is that anything that beats the mega damage armor rating, you get full damage. Anything that is less is half damage. Um, but it's still at a 10 to 1 ratio, not a 100 to 1 ratio. So if you take an SDC damage uh, weapon that does D6 times 10, um, you can still do some damage, but again, you're dividing it by 10. So it's going to be 1D6 mega damage if you get over the armor rating. If not, you're going to half whatever that is. So that D6 might be a 6 mega damage, but it might go down to 3. And uh, that, I think, uh, takes care of a lot of the, especially when you start talking about things like the Titan Juicer and, and some of the character classes that have umpteen amounts of SDC damage. It allows them to play in the game with a little bit more freedom without worrying about some random dude with a, an energy pistol hitting them and then all of a sudden they explode because a random dude shot them with a pistol. I got to tell you that I have a 180 degree opposite opinion of that. I am yep. I, I I'm kind of with these guys down here. You can't hurt it. Matter of fact, I don't even play with the rule that 101 SDC does one mega damage. No, SDC does not harm mega damage in any way, shape, or form. Move on, nice and simple. Now, now, but, but here's the strength. Here's the strength of this. Yep. He just showed you an entirely different way that you can handle mega damage and you're still playing rifts you're still playing a, the palladium system this is what's kind of baked into the game yes there are rules for mega damage you can argue all day and all night that's how it's supposed to work sure but kevin would have zero issues with you making that kind of change to your game nor, nor should he i mean again i think at some point you're no longer playing rifts but i don't think that's that causes it but yeah i'm on the opposite side of the spectrum of that one no mega damage if it hits you and your sdc you're annihilated if or, or structural damage uh, yeah sdc uh, if you were uh if you're if you're an sd weapon hitting something with mdc you're not going to hurt it because i think there are just some aspects in life like that in, in the purpose of my game i compared to like starships sorry but somebody isn't going to stand outside a, a starship yeah. with a knife and a, and a nine millimeter and break through the starship enterprise it isn't going to work but that phaser can take out a city you know so yeah. so th that that's how i reconcile it. and everything in between is is good but i see a lot of people use the mega damage times 10 rule personally i don't like it but it is absolutely if you're struggling with it is one of the things you can do. It's still more powerful. It's still certainly going to protect you compared to SDC. And I get the idea. In fact, one of the things I really, really, really want to talk to Kevin and Sean about, and I think this is on the first time we're talking game mechanics, is this weird thing that when you read the Rift's books, it talks about mega damage kind of as like, hey, mega damage is powerful and not everybody has it. Yet when you play the game, everybody's loaded up with mega damage all over the place. And how do you reconcile that? Because if you are going to have mega damage all over the place and literally everybody's got it, then Frank is right. But That's I like to go the I other direction with it. Mm -hmm. That's one of the reasons I did the changes that I did was to provide an SDC character um, a, 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 like, guess what? If all you have is 30 SDC and 15 hit points, uh, that, that mega damage laser rifle is still going to blow you to bits. Okay. Even at times 10. Okay. Because it's still 2d4 times 10. It is still going to more times than not kill you. Um, but it, it allows for things that have much greater amounts of SDC, at least that, that fighting chance to carry on. And I found that it, it's a nuanced approach, and there's more to it than what I explained. Um, but it provides a much greater avenue for players to think outside of, I got to have an MDC character, or I'm not going to be able to play this game. Because that is, I, I think, a foul. That is, that is a fair complaint, but I think that has been, I cannot wait to talk to Kevin and Sean about that. Because I, think, I agree yeah. with that assessment. I just wish it wasn't true. It's, it's a fallacy that I think most people have when they look at the system and they naturally come to that conclusion. And I would be the first person to, to go against. I myself 
will never play a character that starts with MDC outside of the armor that they wear. That's it. I, I refuse to do it. And if I die, I probably did something stupid. I deserve to die. But I think that's part of the player experience and mm -hmm. I think rifts. Um, that's one of the problems with the system is that it leads players to think to that. And it's also a game design problem that the game masters kind of have to think their way through a bit. When you design your encounters, don't start throwing an entire Katani slave uh, slave force against uh, the But this is Rifts. I'm supposed to go with all the biggest and brightest and baddest and so forth. <laughs> you, you don't have to. And that's why and that's why I say make it a discrete adventure that only involves a very small scale conflict and then build up from there. Um, because you don't need to have something that has a thousand mega damage as the big boss at the end. I'm going to read a super chat real quickly. $20. Thank you very much, Crafty Matt, for the super chats. Why would anyone play the Rifts RPG by Palladium Books? One word, dog boys. You're the, the best bestest system. dog boy, aren't you? <laughs> Who's a good dog boy? Uh, thank you for the $20, Crafty Matt. All right, let's uh, uh, let, let's hit the next one here. Uh, again, let's let's try to be kind of quick on this. Uh, as I played, if you guys saw it, the intro to this uh, uh, live stream, was even Kevin talking about this in his own book. Um, oh, my God, I can't find the rule in the rule book. So, again, a lot of people come up, you know what? I can't find anything in here. This game sucks. What do you guys say? Make it up. And there's also, you can noodle it out real quick. It's not that difficult. It's not a difficult system. It's just make a number and roll with it. Or take a little bit of time, make some notes where pages are, what's on the pages. <clears throat> You're like, oh, I need the perception rules. They're on this page of result. I didn't and even I know point. Palladium had perception rules until recently. Yes, that's one of the other issues that I have with the system, but that's, that's the precise <laughs> point. But I mean, in terms of in, like, it's it's a quick ruling, like it, like you don't need to spend more than 30 seconds determining a MOOC on a piece of paper. You need uh, an MDC armor or MDC main body, what weapon attack they're going to do, what it is, and then keep track of their damage and then keep track of like how many hits they've taken. And then, oh, look at that. Uh, a couple of hits and they're dead uh, or or many hits and they're dead. I mean, like, you don't have to spend 30 minutes developing an encounter. Throw a plus to their strike. Throw a plus to their dodge. Make it so that they can't parry, whatever the case may be. You don't have to go into that. Maybe this is a being that has absolutely no concept of dodging or parrying. All they are is full-on attack. So all you got to do is worry about what their MDC for their main body is, what their main attack is going to be, maybe a secondary attack and what their plus to strike is and off you, a number of attacks. And then off you go. Okay. Raise your hand if you were or are in the military. Okay. So for this next one, firearms combat rules are stupid. They make no sense. Ah. <laughs> they can be tough. The Tell me you've never you. fired a weapon. We just got this comment recently. <laughs> Tell me you've never fired a weapon without telling me you never <laughs> fired a weapon. You know. What do you guys have to say about that? Tim, I'll let you start. Um, you know, they can be a little, a little, little tough to drudge through all the different firearm rules that there are. Um, you use, you make it work for you. You know, this is the theme of riffs. Make it work for you. If you want a couple of pluses, if you want to allow the PP to your to hit, great. Four or less you miss. It's 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 a cinematic game. Um forget, oh, yeah. forget about the D20 system. Okay. If I can say anything, Rifts takes you out of the slavishness that the D20 system takes you into. Uh, you you do not need to care about how many five foot squares you can move before you can pull a trigger on a firearm. Um, conversely, if the GM tells you that you are, oh, I'm aiming a shot, but I want to fire a burst. Okay, you know what? You, burst rule. Okay, you're going to get a plus one to hit. Uh, what level are you? You're level six. 
I'll give you another plus two because that's 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 what the weapon proficiency says. Uh, you, you're plus three. Roll. That's it. That's all you got to do. You don't have to worry about it. Oh, I will determine whether you have hit the guy that is hiding in the trench by saying, in my own head, you need to roll a 12 on the dice. The natural dice roll must be a 12 or higher to go and hit that person hiding in a trench. The fact that your bonuses made you get to a 15, well, but you rolled an 11. Okay, you rolled really well, but you didn't hit the dude. Okay, next round. Off we go. I just, I yeah, just well, yeah. One of the complaints is like he doesn't have range modifiers in there, which is not true. That's not true. I, it's just it's very subtle in how it's and written, that, and that goes back to the editing process. And and I, I when I went through the close combat and range combat rules, that was one of the things I went through every one of the systems and I looked at every one of the range combat rules and I normalized it. And it can be done. I, and I would love the chance to present this to Kevin and Sean. Um, I, I would love to be compensated for that. But, but, but <laughs> hey, um, if, if, they, if they are going to do a new series of uh, or an updated rule system that applies to the megaversal uh, rule system, I, I would love to provide some suggestions. It doesn't mean they have to listen to me, but there are certain things that they can do to, to, to make things, to tighten things up. Um, and, and the rules are there. It's just, unfortunately, we're talking about those stealth updates that if you don't look in the right section or if you skimmed through it a little too fast, you are going to miss some of the things that they talk about in terms of pluses and minuses based on the combat. And guess what? It's the game master's decision. If the guy is hiding in a trench and I tell you you need to roll 18 or higher because he is cowering in the trench there is still a chance that you can shoot through the ground in front of the trench and your mega damage rifle will actually blow a hole and theoretically hit the dude or dudette. Great. That's, that's just a thing that I will decide on my own. Okay. And I made an entire chart for that because based on cover and concealment yep. for my after the bomb, you know, team and team after the bomb games. So yep. I don't even use the core palladium rule. I kind of do. You still get your same, yeah. you know, pl uh, weapon proficiency stuff, but I have an entire table that goes over cover and concealment and, you know, armor ratings over, because remember, that is a an SDC-based game where I incorporate all that, and game masters and players alike. Players, you gotta stop whining, and game masters, you gotta do that. But it says here, I have to roll a five or better. No, you're 100 feet out. It's an eight or better. Uh, <laughs> a lot of people miss that, you know, just that simple rule that's in there. But even still, you know, it doesn't make sense for it to be an eight or better because you're running at full speed, capping off three rounds. Sure, you're trained, but you, you know, you're level three. You're, you're, you're trained, but you are not some sort of God's gift to, you know, you're not John Wick, and even most of that crap's fake anyway. You know, in cinematic game, you can get by with that crap. The, the point is, is I'm telling you, you need a 15 or higher to hit. You know, it just, that, that's what it is. Or, 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 you know what, here's the other way I can do this. You're firing wild, so, uh, and we'll consider it blind too. So that's minus 14. Good luck. <laughs> or no, 13, whatever. Uh, who cares? I'm telling you it's minus 14. So I, you can either, we can either make target number harder or I can give you a million penalties. Either way, it's the same, it's the same thing. Game masters, don't let players run the game. That's your job. And if you're, as long as you're fair, reasonable, and consistent, boom. So, all right, uh, we are taking way too much time on some of this stuff. We're we're supposed to be in the middle of segment three right now. We're still in segment two. Uh, let let's quickly hit the uh, these. Uh, we'll start with Mal Malachi. I'm gonna hit you first. We'll just go in circle. Malachi, Frank, Timothy for this one. Um, one of the complaints is the game is stuck in the '80s. Now that can mean a bunch of things to different people. When I actually asked that question, here's how it came out: everything from oh bad takes on on sensitivity to uh, oh my God, look at all the tables. My God, nobody wants to read all those tables to, uh, what was it? There was one other one that was uh, pretty prevalent. Um, I forget there, there was some, there's something else about how the rules were set up that you just don't do anymore. Oh, la class and level system. People calling that dated and old, you know, and passe and so forth. Doesn't D and D still do that? I'm just saying anyway. So you take it how you want Malachi. We're starting with you, but uh, the game is stuck in the eighties. What do you say to people that? That's part of the charm of it that stuck in the 80s. You know, it's a throwback to a different time. 
Yeah. Oh, but okay, so it's a throwback. So you mean you know that's great. It's good to have got some nostalgia berries, but it isn't good for today. Yeah, it's still good for today. Because I it's think I, I I think see, unlike even you know OSR style D and D, which I do think is stuck in the seventies eighties in a good nostalgic way. I don't think Palladium is stuck in the 80s. Maybe the layout, you know, but and we've talked well, about that a hundred yeah. times, but the layout game itself is nothing oh. like that. I agree with you on that. I think it is. Uh, the layout and anything, I think, could use an overhaul, but an organization, always organization, but no, I don't think it's stuck in the 80s. I think it took the 80s and pressed forward with it. Okay, uh, Frank, th thoughts I, about it being stuck in the 80s? I, I find it ironic because uh, Kevin has been on record for saying he hates tables and he has limited the number of tables in any of his books. I think the greatest example, his missile chart is like the greatest and most expansive table you will ever find in any Palladium book. And that is the, the, the limitation to it. And, and it's really just more information, line by line information. Uh, he does not like tables. See, Kevin and I are opposite on that one. I love tables. They make referencing so much easier. <laughs> I would I would love to talk to Kevin and Sean about keyword implementation and uh, point form notes in terms of uh, simplifying the rules instead of having a paragraph that could be interpreted in different ways, uh, but providing more, uh, more bullet formatting. Uh, to provide a, a slightly easier reading and processing experience for game masters and for uh, players of the current age to better understand what we're talking about. Um, in, in terms of sensitivity, I, I honestly, um, like, there's a number of companies out there that have gotten themselves into a lot of trouble um, by doing stupid things in terms of sensitivity, in terms of over complicating their approach to sensitivity yeah. or completely doing the stupid in terms of putting something out without considering the cultural impact of what they're putting out. Uh, you know, Watsi and the Hadozi uh, problem. Mm -hmm. Like how could this possibly have gone through their editorial process without thinking that White dude captains and monkey-like subjective, uh, you know, slave-like labor would be something that would not cause a problem, okay? Um, other game systems have done the stupid. I've not seen something in terms of rifts that, that from my perspective, any anyways that, that that would cause problems in terms of sensitivity I'm, so I'm so it builds upon a lot of stereotypes that are out there but remember stereotypes are based yeah. in some sort of tr some sort of truth but but and, and i don't want to dive down this rabbit hole too much but but there's a difference between cultural uh, and sean says this a lot difference between cultural appropriation and cultural appreciation and you know yeah almost everybody who makes a game based on japan does one of two things Either A, the 1980s taken over America corporate Japanese person or the Bushido Japanese person because it's such an easy trope to do. Is it wrong? I, I've never met a Japanese person that my wife is literally Japanese, a Japanese citizen, not even an American citizen. And she laughs at the people like, why do people complain about this? It's just nerd fantasy stuff. Who the hell cares? This is one of the things that, that I think Palladium has uh, a, a definitive edge in terms of that department is that they take a cultural uh, myth and they've twisted and and not in a bad way they've adapted it to a post-apocalyptic session mm -hmm. uh, it, you know you look at england there is and and and, and hey i do not i do not like the arthurian legend but it was it was it was taken. They ran with the Arthurian legend, Merlin, and the rest of it. If it makes you feel better. I feel the same way about after the bomb, and they do the same thing there. But they also added in a uh, Splugorth. Uh, the Splugorth are there. There is uh, something that's going on in Scotland that is entirely different. Um, you go to Japan. Again, Japan, you're either going to be a, a ghost in the shell, neo-tech noir kind of thing, or you're going to be the, like you said, the samurai interpretation. Mm -hmm. They did both. And quite frankly, they did both in a way that I think um, I, I would be surprised that someone would look at that and have a significant issue with cultural appropriation. Um, there are other games that could legitimately be 
targeted for that 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 kind of an accusation. But I don't see anything out of Rifts that that quite frankly, uh, Rifts Africa has some issues with it. Uh, I'll grant that. Uh, but that's that's a slightly other discussion because quite frankly, Rifts Africa was supposed like one of a number of books that were supposed to be developed. Australia has one book. There were a number of other books that were referenced in Australia that never got produced. That is, and, and most of the problems that people bring up with Australia are supposed to be addressed in Australia 2 and 3. They were planned, they were never produced. So um, there, there are certain parts of that discussion that, okay, granted, you, you, got, you, you bring a valid point, but I have a counterpoint. They never got around to producing the books to actually address those issues. Fair enough. All right, let's hit the last one here. Uh, skill percentages are too low. And actually, this is one I kind of agree with. I'm not necessarily saying I agree with it in riffs, but I can tell you that in the new After the Bomb, you know, I'm starting off, I'm supposed to be a character that lives in the wild and I have a 30% chance of wilderness survival. Ugh. So, and I, actually another one is, is played in fantasy. I have an issue with the priests and played in fantasy. I know everybody gets all spurgy on me and wants to correct my percentages, but I'm still going to say it because it makes you guys angry. 7% chance to turn undead or whatever the hell it is in uh in in palladium fantasy um i do think that some of the start not all some of the starting percentages are too low and while i do agree with what frank said earlier in terms of you're not supposed to be coming out of the gate just doing everything when when your base chance to do something basic is like you know 25 and 30 percent and it's supposed to be kind of core to the class I struggle with it. I don't think Rifts has as much of a problem with that as After the Bomb does, believe it or not, uh, because the core things you're supposed to do with your class is you get a nice bonus and so forth. But I have noticed in some Palladium things, and people were mentioning this as well for Rifts, so now you guys can chime in, that some of the skill percentages are too low for a core ability in a class. Here's what I say to that. A lot of those, that's when you're under duress. If you're just going about your business, doing your thing, surviving in the wilderness... I don't think you need a skill roll, but if you're, you know, under some kind of duress, then you need to make the skill roll. Okay. How how many people? Here's the, here's the no. I, I think the skill the percentages are just fine. How many people have a hard time with technology today? How many people are are so are so in love with their iPhones because it's so simple? How many people have a hard time setting up their freaking TVs? I'm in the IT field, you know. What okay, you how many how food? many people? Let's use that. How many people with the IT OCC have that problem? Oh yeah, yeah. And that's the thing. You know, your your level one, your service desk, your skills are going to be slightly better than your average bear. So having a thirty percent computer use or computer repair is appropriate because I'd you're fire the guy. If thirty percent coming into my field, I'd fire you instantly. Well, your field is an, an advanced field. No, you no, no, no. I'm talking, I have literally, I tell people in my job, it takes mm -hmm. a year and a half. And they'll scoff at that. Oh, I've been doing IT forever. It'll take you a year and a half. You're going to get the basics down in a month. But the yeah. nuances takes a year and a half. And every single person has come back and said, wow, it did take a year and a half. But they weren't at a 30% level after that month. They were at a good 50 to 80% level. You know, that 80, I could tell he's military because we love that 80% solution, right? <laughs> um, they were all 80% at that uh, at that one month mark. It was the 20% nuance that took a year and a half to learn. I would never allow somebody in my job with 30% chance of helping the customer properly. But somebody coming into your field has already have years of experience. In yeah, IT. that's an so chance. <laughs> that, that's exactly what I'm saying, though. A beginner OC, uh, coming straight into the OCC, coming straight into the IT OCC, that 30% computer repair, 40% computer repair, that's them starting off at first level. And, and as you progress in your experiences, it, gets, it goes up. That's legit. That is real world. I'm okay with that. Yeah, I'm not. Uh, but now what law dog says a computer guy would have an OCC bonus likely 20 right again the complaints that I was saying were specifically about like the after the bomb stuff where if you look at something they don't get these bonuses or at least not nearly as much but yeah if you're getting a 20% bonus 
to that base 30 percent i have zero 50 percent is fully that's viable you have 50 50 chance of succeeding you fail today you succeed next time whatever but when you have like a 30 percent chance when you have a 22 percent chance whatever I, I i look back at that and say eh, no not not somebody not a core skill for a professional and don't forget of your IQ bonuses. If you have a, if your character has a high high IQ, you're getting bonuses to your all of your skills. Yeah, but that starts at 17, and most people or 16, and most people aren't rolling that. You're right, but it still it plays in. It, it's still a That's factor. Fair. One of the things that people uh, largely forget is the penalty, but also the bonus tables mm. that are included in the skills. And this is something that uh, I, I force myself to develop in terms of, um, you know, the, the social aspect of adventure design. So if I say that there is going to be a mechanic shop because I have one of the guys in the party that's an operator, okay? The operator might only have a 55% at first level skill for mechanical engineer, whatever it is, okay? But you're using a workshop that is developed specifically for that task. A computer technician is developing something in a computer lab. He has the reference books, he has the tools, he has other people that he can use. Apply a bonus. If I have an, a first level operator working in a mechanic shop, he gets a plus 20% to a skill check. If he has a journeyman assisting him, that's another plus five, maybe another plus 10, depending on what level they are. Add in some of the things like they understand the debt, like they have the piloting skill in the vehicle that is being repaired. I'll give them another bonus. They are not under duress. I will not give them a negative. But if there is something that says that there is um, a time crunch, Palladium already has the negatives in place for you to say it's it's in the middle of a combat scenario. You're trying to take a torque wrench to a power armor that is <laughs> shooting back at the same time. You're going to have some negatives to repairing the armor. I'm sorry. You're going to be rolling against a 15 or 20 percent. Now, now, this is exactly the answer I was looking for with regard to this because I got people spurking in chat. Ah, oh, you're not looking at the right pages. I know what I'm saying, guys. OK, yeah. I, and this is something that I think that the that the main book misses out on saying overtly yeah. is exactly yeah. what he say. First of all, if it's routine, why even roll? You just you just succeeded. OK, if it's not routine, if it is something that takes, uh, you know, a little bit of effort for whatever reason. Yes, you've got assistance. Let that give those bonuses out. What it doesn't say on page 59 that I get these bonuses. Game masters, you have to use a bit of common sense. Use it, you know, if there are penalties, there's got to be reasons for bonuses. And it's something now, like with the game that I'm writing, that I've written directly in there. Let characters use imagination, engineering, and realism in terms of getting help, having those technical manuals, having time, uh, uh, referring to a friend, whatever, to give them bonuses uh, to those roles. Apply them. Apply them. It's okay. And Even this though it says. I would love to see the skill system in Rifts uh, or Palladium at large develop a little bit more. Something I would suggest to, 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 to Sean and Kevin, I could plug in this, um, is reset some of the skills in the way that they're presented so that there are certain, and it's already there in terms of how some of the skills are written, but not all of them. Some of the skills develop synergies for other skills. Pull that out and put it in the face of the reader. Computer operations gives a plus 5% to computer, or computer programming gives a plus 10% to computer operations, writ large. Just call it what it yep. is, okay? Computer hacking gives plus 5% to computer programming. Um, lore, lore uh, you know, like different skills provide the different bonuses. It's in there already. If you, if you look at the cook skill, you could take cooking, 30% plus 5% per, per level. And take it again. <laughs> and take it again, and you can be a semi-professional chef, and yep. you gain a plus 10 bonus. Or take it a third time. It's not written there, but why wouldn't you say take it a third time, and now you are a professional chef. Now you get a plus 20% on top of the plus 10%. You could do that for every one of the skills. You go to carpentry. 
journeyman carpenter only knows how to put a hammer to a nail. Now we're going to add some uh, level of skill to this. You've taken it twice. Now you are plus 10%. You take it a third time, you're a professional carpenter. Now you have plus 30%. But guess what? You have taken the skill slots to specialize in that, and that skill might then provide you another synergy elsewhere. Um, I, I have no problems with that. Um, and, and I would suggest that there's a lot of things like that that are already baked into certain areas that just need to be formalized in a new skill set uh, developed for, you know, a, a Rift's Renaissance edition. Whatever, whatever they call the next version, I would say, a core rule system, add that into the skill set so that, it, you know, regardless of whether you're playing Fantasy, Heroes Unlimited, or Rifts, it's the same skill, okay, if it's available. Don't talk to me about computer operations for Lightning and Fantasy. Um, but then, you know, you have that same skill, and then you can, it's just easier to transport from one setting to another. You were going to put something up next. No, 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 I, I misclicked because the okay. chat bumped. Um, I do want to hit... Uh, 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 we're we're supposed to be already like ending seg toward the end of segment four, and we're still in segment two. So uh, I'm going to read super chats right now, and we do have to move on. But this shows you how passionate people are about riffs, and there's a lot to say about riffs. So I'm not angry at all as long as these guys are willing to stay. I'm willing to host. So, but uh, over in the Rumble side, Grizzly Beard, and this is back when we were talking about the. Um, the IP issues for $2 says, thank you very much again, Grizzly Beardo. At the end of the day, Kevin had something that was very much worth protecting. 40K Rogue Trader was published the same year as After the Bomb, and both feature Empires of Humanity. Games Workshop loves to borrow. I don't know if he's still watching, but Sudsy Sutherland has a great story about uh, the word pauldron and Games Workshop trying to like... Yeah. Uh, do like uh, oh is it copyrighted or some nonsense mm -hmm. like that like what's okay so yeah people get a little ridiculous about about some things like that yeah but thank you for the two dollars i appreciate that space marine yeah i was gonna say they tried to copyright the term space marine good luck with that one two very <laughs> generic words you're trying to copyright okay that's why we uh, now have adeptus astartes in terms of their ip because now it's a term that they can they can yeah. protect yep all right, uh, Table Runner Crispy, good to see you here, sir. Says, about three months ago, I introduced my uh, group to Palladium System via Heroes Unlimited. They love the system, go figure. And I'm going to put this other comment up after this, because I because these are going to swing together for me, and you'll see why in just a moment. Uh, Michael Mamma says, boom. Dumb Palladium rule for art skills, literally in the books. Only for art skills, you have to take it twice to be a professional grade, but you only have to take medical doctor once to be a real doctor. That is not true, sir. Because, especially if you go back to Palladium uh, uh, Heroes Unlimited, you must have a minimum of a master's degree, I think it is, or is it a doctorate, in order to be a doctor, in order to take the medical doctor skill. Now, but that's not an OCC. Well, an OCC assumes you've done all that. That's why I said OCCs are professional grade when I was talking before, all right? But let's go back up to this one. Kevin, I think it was, and I might be wrong about this one. One of the autistic people out there can correct me because you guys like doing that a lot. Uh, <laughs> on the uh, on the idea that uh, some people don't like the skill system. They find it confusing. I much prefer, and I mean this, I do think that they need tweaks, but I much prefer the education system from Heroes Unlimited than OCCs. I wish all of the games used the education system. That's me personally. Uh, you know, your mileage may vary on that one. I I find them to be fantastic. Uh, it works so for a modern system, for, for sure, it works for a modern system. For rifts, where you don't have a scholastic system that's there fair. is no education system in place so yeah but they, they kind of tempered with that with after the yeah. bomb by having the uh the the different uh oh my god i cannot think of the term uh, uh apprenticeships and so yeah. forth they could they, yeah. they could have moved something like that over. but but you are right i i that makes sense i get it i'm not complaining i like occs as well i'm not against class-based games it was just surprising because i'm pretty sure it was Kevin's like yeah you know this the 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 heroes unlimited education system causes confusion I'm like how yeah it's amazing how many phds there are out there <laughs> you know but when so there for shouldn't a be system it works brilliantly yes. for a post-apocalyptic setting uh, you can't use you can't use that because because that, that that just defeats the purpose of a post-apocalyptic setting uh, there are no universities. There are no online uh, journal access. 
you can't access journal articles to learn something. Um, in, in a way, you can. I mean, I know it's not the global communication network, but there's there's still tidbits out there. But again, like I said, comparing it to After the Bomb, I think the After the Bomb is a good te- the the current After the Bomb, not the original, is a good template for how they could do it not saying in any way shape or form that riffs is bad wrong or what other uh, i like occs i'm just saying that i but i like the education system more <laughs> they're both good so i hope that makes sense to folks but uh but yeah and and you know as as uh frank was saying you can do this with other things as well you know if you're doing a strict reading of the rules maybe it doesn't implicitly say that or explicitly say that but implicitly because of this and i dove a lot when i was looking at game design for my game i looked a lot about the difference between secondary skills and the professional skills there is a distinct difference between professional skills and and uh the uh secondary skills that i don't think a lot of game masters plug into you know it, it mentions it in the art oh yeah if you got secondary skill in art you can do it you, you got some good stuff but you're not professional quality where a professional artist even with a lower skill rating lower percentage chance is still going to be seen as professional you can do that with carpentry i don't see why you couldn't look my stepdad knew how to build a, a basic four walls in a house but i wouldn't call him a carpenter <laughs> things would be a little crooked probably by the time things are done but it'd be feasible a couple leaks maybe uh because he was a decent handyman with regard to that, but he wasn't a carpenter. So why not have uh, the, the the secondary skill side and the professional side? I wish Palladium would actually emphasize that more in a way like Frank said. What are you guys' thoughts? I use yeah. that in my Saturday game um, because since they're the residual of FEMA, they, have, they do have a little bit of edu- better education but they use the I'm using the OCC because they're they've been specialized in their families. Yeah. Like my wife was a beastmaster. Her family raises horses, made for the swamp. Like my, one of the character, he's a power armor pilot. His family, it was the one power armor, so he goes and trains. Yeah, literally and it, nothing wrong with OCCs at all. I, I I guess my point was more I was surprised to find that people didn't like the education or found it confusing I, or something. I love it. I love the education system. It needs tweak like everything else in Playdom. It needs tweaking. <laughs> what? Uh, um, then there's this comment here. Just give them the plus thirty bonus when they're doing something they do in the ordinary because their skill uses. I would even say if it's routine, just give it to them. They succeed. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Uh, with that said, yeah, yeah uh, plus thirty percent. Use those bonuses. Completely agree. Find ways of incorporating them that make sense. You know what? I I know that it normally takes an hour for me to do this thing. I'm going to spend my entire, I'm going to be methodical about this and just take my time. I got all day. Great. You know what? I'll give you plus 25% or, or whatever, or whatever number works for you and your group. You got to remember the medical doctor skill also comes with a slew of prerequisites. And yep. a lot of the classes aren't even able to take it because of the, the IQ. requirements for the education. No, just the yep. education, not, not even the IQ. Most of them say you're not allowed to take the prerequisites that you would need to take medical doctor. Oh, Science fair. Okay. Is, is one of the most restrictive categories in rifts, uh, which means that you will never be eligible to take medical doctor because they, you need botany and biology or biology and chemistry. Sorry. Um, secondary skills is, is a bit of a bugbear for me. Uh, one of the things I like to do is I'll take secondary skills and I'll let players, you, you choose your secondary skills like your OCC says you can. Uh, but any of the secondary skills you can roll against as the base percentage, um, just as a way of allowing players a little bit more access to skills. Um, like carpentry is one of those ones that comes up. Cooking is another one um, where like anybody can fry an egg. Okay. Mm-hmm. The base percentage for cook, I think is 30%, 40% maybe. Um, yeah. You, you can fry an egg and, and, and you're taking your time. So I'll give you a bonus. You fry an egg. Don't take too much time. You're going to overfry it. Exactly. So if, <laughs> if, if you're not paying attention or if you rolled really poorly, I'll just develop the cinematic scenario that you got developed, you know, you got distracted and you, you turned around and your egg is black. Like that's, just, that's just bad news bears for you. Carry on. Do you want to crack another egg and carry on and pay a little bit more attention to your secondary skill? Um, whereas the ones that you select for your OCC you develop a little bit more as your character develops and, and you have a better chance of succeeding. But I allow any character to roll a secondary skill 
at the base percentage just to, like everybody knows a, a base level of literacy a base level of math uh, a base level of cooking that kind of thing yeah but i mean the post-apocalyptic in clear state it's they don't know literacy they don't know math so but i get it <clears throat> I, I would challenge that, and, and, and I wrote an article on, on my blog about literacy, and I used American statistics on this only because... Are you saying we're post-apocalyptic retarded? <laughs> no, retarded. But only because they've got the statistics and they've got the, the data to back it up. Um, the current literacy rates, if you were to take into account the way the Rifts looks at literacy, uh, the U.S. is sitting at about a 25% illiteracy rate. Um, in, in, in terms of how the skill works. So it's it's something that like, and the article goes in depth on, on the analysis, um, but it supports more and you know, more to the point, it gives a game master a way of interpreting how the coalition states deals with illiteracy and numeracy uh, for their people. And that's why I allow rolling against the base percentage because you cannot have a society that develops uh, power armor, robots, and energy weapons, and great big cities without some level of literacy and numeracy, even at the base level. It, it's just impossible. It, it's, it's a point of argument. It's a point of contention. I um, won't go into it now. Um, we can go into it off net, so to speak. <laughs> but it, it's, it's, it's a thing. It's, I, I, can't, I can't grasp the concept of a completely illiterate society and yet you still have samus power armor and and uh, people going to war and not understanding how to read the borders fair enough okay got two and then we're going to move on to the next uh segment uh games workshop tried to copyright oh. imperial guard imperial china <laughs> maybe you would have yep. had a small issue with that uh games workshop tries to copyright a lot of stuff I, I love all the copyrights kevin has but when you look at them they are very there's only one that i complain about that kevin's got and that's eclip well, yeah i don't know about that one it's a bit of a stretch uh, it's but, e dash clip yeah well well uh, right and that's why like occ OCC is not trademarked, but O.C.C. Dot C dot, when you follow the Palladium uh, format uh, style guide is, which, OK, you know what? I like that because, honest, that is a very Palladium thing to put the dots between uh, letters of an acronym because you're not supposed to do that by the by the by the uh, the style guides. But the Palladium style guide specific to Palladium books says we do that here. And OK, you know what? Copyright it. Have it. That's yours. And thank you for the five dollars, Gunther. And Gunther, also, look at this. Hey, I said, look at that. Wow, stream here is getting weird. Gifted five Legion of Myth memberships. Now, here's the good news and bad news about you five people. Who are you fine folks? Uh, Mike Deemer, haven't seen you in a long time. Agile Monk, Elder Luna, Robert Beatty, and JP uh, Got Ruckus, who's actually been watching. I hope I said your name right. Either way, um, you now have access to thousands of more videos. If you want the rants, go find them. They're there. None of them have been deleted. Uh, uh, what else? You, you will not be inputted for today's giveaway if we have it before, I don't know, midnight <laughs> at this point. But uh, you will uh, you, you, you will be added after the fact uh, to uh, to listen. You will be now put in, at least for the next three, four weeks, into the uh, automatically into the giveaway list. So there you go. Uh, go ahead and you guys should thank Gunther the Mad for that. And I thank Gunther the Mad for that. All right. Uh, let's. Uh, where am I here? Okay, so the next segment is going to be on system mechanics and innovations. We may have kicked system mechanics in the ding ding already. I don't know, but uh, we're going to talk about the system mechanics and innovations in the next video. Uh, let's put this up here. Oh, I probably should have said that before the super chats, but whatever. Uh, the charity we support is the Wounded Warrior Project, a national nonpartisan organization whose mission is to honor and empower the wounded warriors. Please refer to the video's description for a link to where you can make your hopefully tax-deductible donation, and there will be a 24-hour Veterans Day live stream. Uh, we're trying to narrow down some stuff. Heathen Dog is still trying to get all the players to... He's got the players that want to join, but they apparently they can't they can't get a time nailed down yet. Uh, but to, he's going to run a Paranoia 2nd Edition game, which I'm jealous that I don't get to play because I'm going to have to sleep during that time. be my one moment of sleep. Um, 
But he's going to run, a, a, so he'll have a live uh, live play of uh, Paranoia 2nd Edition. And yeah, and we're going to do a bunch of weird stuff. I don't know, I'll probably play a video game. We'll talk. Last time I thought I was going to play a video game, and I didn't. We just talked the entire time. It was great. Uh, Sean showed up from Palladium Books. That was awesome. A year before, I did play a video game, though. Anyway, you get the idea. That's going to be on Veterans Day, so uh, I hope to see uh, folks then. And of course, if you enjoy this discussion, please like this video. Subscribe to all the panelists' channels, which... You can find in the description all those articles that Frank keeps talking about on uh, Rogue Scholar. Check that out. Do it now. And learn how to make characters. Scholar of the Adventures, not Rogue Scholar.